Summer Gone, the first novel by David McFarlane, which is centered around a canoe trip that a 12-year-old boy takes with his father, was shortlisted for the Giller Prize last year, and it's received a lot of very well-deserved reviews and high praise. So that David's previous work, which is called The Danger Tree, it's a memoir of Newfoundland, which was celebrated everywhere it was read. David McFarlane is also a columnist for the Globe and Mail, and I'm delighted to have him here this evening. But as I just, with great pleasure, bring him out, I want to add a footnote that I wish he'd been here last year, because if you were, you probably, you know, your head is probably still echoing with the, the curious rap song that Stuart McLean presented. <laughs> In fact, I'm sure you're all humming it now. As you, it was based on a, a phrase which Stuart assumed was now part of the Canadian lexicon, and a phrase which you may sing along with now if you want, was Perrin Beatty is a son of a bitch. <laughs> now, the reason I mention that as I welcome David is that it's not his fault. But he wrote a profile, actually a very astute and not even occasionally undeservedly flattering, but also very astute, profile of me for the Globe and Mail. During which, in fact it was just up the road here in our cottage, I looked at David with his notebook open and I said, he asked, had asked me what I thought of CBC management at the time, and I said, well what I did was I gave Stuart the punchline for his rap song a few years ago. <laughs> But it was, uh, some reporters would cheat and use that. In fact, I have no one to blame for its publication but me. Because as I saw David writing the phrase down with a little bit of pleasure in his notebook, I said, in case you didn't get that, that's S-O-N-O-N. <laughs> so it's always, it's not his fault. But in a way, he's already part of the PGI's Play the Red Barn history. Now forget all that and welcome one of Canada's loveliest writers, David McFarland. When I asked what kind of a thing I should read this evening, the answer was uh, eloquently to the point. <laughs> A short thing, they said. <laughs> As it happens, I have some stories that uh, fit this description. By happy coincidence, they're called short stories. <laughs> and I have one here that I submitted to the Saturday Night Magazine short story contest. Uh, it, it didn't win. It, in fact, it wasn't shortlisted. I don't think it, it made it past the first set of cuts, actually. But genius is seldom recognized in its own time. <laughs> Although it occurs to me now that uh, perhaps the title was a bit of a drawback. As submission to the Saturday Night Short Story Contest seemed to lack a certain flair. Uh, but at any rate, here it is. <clears throat> oh, oh uh, um, I should mention, uh, this particular short story contact, contest uh, was sponsored by Absolute Vodka. And uh, the only demand of this otherwise extremely generous sponsor was that absolute vodka had to be mentioned <laughs> somewhere in the story. <laughs> A submission to the Saturday Night Short Story Contest. When they were finished, he poured out two glasses of absolute vodka. <laughs> it was now late. 
He always kept a bottle beside the bed in those days. In the distance, they could hear the artillery. The antelope were frightened on nights like this. And the shadows of leaves moved in the moonlight. She turned toward him. Soon she would have to return to the hills and to the partisans and to the cafe where she wrote her letters to him. She wrote him often to say she loved him. She wrote in the cafe on the mornings when the coffee was hot and the bread was sweet and the old man always sat in the corner drinking absolute water. She said, did the earth move for you? Once he had been a bullfighter. There had been grants for everything in those days. But that was long ago. He wondered if they would find buffalo tomorrow past the grasses beyond the river. He said to the woman, don't get carried away, it's only vodka. She answered, for some reason. But it's absolute vodka. What did you say? His hearing hadn't been the same since he'd been gored in Pamplona. They'd been drinking screwdrivers all day by the time they noticed the bull. Absolute. Fresh squeezed orange juice. A splash of grenadine. The doctor had said he would never fish for tarpon again. Could have been worse. Absolute vodka, she shouted. Look, he said, we only have to mention it. We don't have to make it the central theme of this short story. But before he finished speaking, she was almost asleep. Half a dozen vodka tonics, absolute Schweppes and wedge of lime, and she was gone. It was as if she'd been on the ropes the whole round, no longer able to move away from his left hook. He had a hell of a left hook. Just ask Callahan. He thought of the time in Venice when they drunk a bottle of absolute vodka and had made love on the roof of the Danielli until the guns came too close. Her, not Callahan. Darling, she whispered, half asleep. How he wished that he loved her. Sometimes it seemed that this damned war would never end. <laughs> he watched her. She slept. The animals were feeding close to the camp. The waiters were clearing up at La Coupole. A thin, transparent line of absolute vodka trickled from her parted lips. Straight. No ice. She snored. All the partisans did. He lay awake. He remembered Paris, and the shadows of the leaves moved in the moonlight, and he poured himself another absolute vodka. There had been a cafe not far from the Gare Montparnasse that he liked. That was before they were lovers. He sat and wrote there every morning and sometimes every afternoon. He worked until he grew tired or hungry or until the gun bearers awoke and demanded their daily vodka martinis. <laughs> Absolute, on the rock. With a twist. The 
food was good and inexpensive in the cafe, and if he didn't have the money to pay, the owner would sometimes accept the German or the Japanese rights to a novel. And if he wanted a woman, there were usually several. Drunk on black Russians. Absolute vodka. Tia Maria. Crushed ice. In the narrow stone walkway, he knew off the boulevard Raspai. They sometimes settled for first serial rights and maybe an option on his next book. And when he did not want a woman, that was also fine. He walked the other way, over the river and beyond the trees, listening to the strange, almost human cries of the hyenas. Hi! Hi! The woman stirred uneasily beside him. He knew this because he heard her ice cubes. In his last years in Paris, he had lived in the Creon. This was before the war. This was when the Canadian dollar was worth something. This was after his hunting accident in Wyoming and on the bad nights, after the nurse had left. He used to hook a fifth of absolute vodka up to the IV drip. <laughs> and lie in bed and watch the very lights bursting over the Luxembourg gardens and listen to the rush of the approaching monsoons in the bamboo. In those days, when he had been a younger man, he sometimes wrote stories in which his characters drank whiskey sodas or slow gin. Sometimes they drank some of the cafe's good red wine. He had always liked the cafe's wine. It was red and good. <laughs> but that was before all this, this woman, this war, this idiotic short story contest. <laughs> he had been happy then in Paris, but everything had changed. He was a writer of short stories after all. Now the money was in movie scripts. So what could he do? If they wanted him to say absolute vodka, he'd say it. It wasn't a question of honesty, he told himself. Not that. He drank deeply. You can probably guess what. But that night, as the woman curled into the bed beside him, he listened to the artillery in the distance. The antelope would be frightened tonight, he knew. And waking from her fitful sleep, the woman murmured, Do you love me, darling? Absolutely, he said. <laughs>